Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Lauren Trevine, and I have the privilege of moderating this session. Uh, this is the Social Impact Award session. As I'm sure you know, each year SIGCHI gives the Social Impact Award to individuals who promote the application of human computer interaction research for pressing social needs. This year, the award is being given to these two fine people right next to me, uh, Ben Peterson and That's Allison Druin <laughs> of the University of Maryland. And it's being given for their joint work in developing the International Children's Digital Library and their individual work in developing new methods that give children a voice in the development of new technologies and for their work on electronic voting systems. Um, ben is an associate professor of computer science at the University of Maryland, and he's the past director of the Human Computer Interaction Lab there. Allison is an associate professor in the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland, and she's the current director of the HCIL. Um, and over the years, I've personally found their work inspiring. And over the years, I've also, as I've been telling them, heard lots of great reports from people who visit their lab and uh, see the way they do their work. And I'm looking forward to hearing them tell us more about the work they've done over the years, uh, their work processes, and all their great results. So please join me in welcoming Allison and Ben. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lauren. And thank all of you. You woke up. You're here. This is wonderful. Thank you. Um, we, uh, we're, we're quite honored to, uh, to receive this award. Um, I'm particularly, personally, um, quite excited because uh, I've been going to CHI for 25 years. Yes, I was in diapers at the time, but yeah, 25 years. I was a student volunteer. Uh, when I was a graduate student at the MIT Media Lab. And at that time, I was incredibly inspired by the people I met, from Ben Schneiderman to, yes, he was taking pictures then, even then, um, to uh, Bill Verplank, Bill Buxton, Ron Becker. Um, it, amazing, the amazing people I met. And um, after that year of student volunteering, I said, I am going to come back with my master's thesis, and I am going to, I am going to be a Kai. Little did I know that I would have to rent a van, put six graduate students in it, and take a very large stuffed computer to, um, to Kai that year. Actually, it was in Toronto. And so, yeah, uh, newbie, short for new beast. So it was at that point that I started thinking about how, you, um, how do you not drag children into the world of computing, but how do you, how do you uh, drag computing into a child's world? And I learned a great deal by mixing the world of Kai, children, and, uh, and my personal interests. I didn't know that 10 years later from then I was going to be I was going to be leading this crazy program called Kai Kids, where uh, the kids would be here at the conference. And uh, it was a cross between summer camp and boot camp, because we were doing everything from creating plenary session materials to the Kai website and newsletter and so on. Um, but it's been a great honor. And uh, I'm no longer running around with children at Kai. It's really very. In some sense, it's sad, but some sense, it's exciting as well. So I'm a relative newbie, uh, only having been a Kai for about 15 years. Uh, and I have a, a kind of a strange path, because I did my PhD at NYU, actually being friendly with Ken Perlin sitting here <laughs> at the time, um, working in computer vision and robotics. And I was doing automatic recognition of license plates and cars they drove by funded by DARPA, and I loved the technology. I've been a geek for a very, very long time. Um, and, uh, but something didn't, didn't ring quite right in my brain. Uh, fortunately, even during my dissertation, I did find a path to make it a little bit more interesting, and I was motivated by how humans perceive the world. So instead of sending images that look like that to the uh, cameras, I sent images that look like this, which is more how humans see things with uh, high resolution in the center and a low resolution in the periphery. 
Uh, so I was motivated even before I had heard the term HCI by humans in computation. Uh, and then it wasn't until after I finished my PhD, I think, that I really heard the term HCI. I uh, met Jim Holland at Belcor and joined his Computer Graphics and Interactive Media Research Group. Uh, and finally saw the light. So for all of you graduate students that are here now, while you're still students, you have a big leg up. So you're lucky to uh, be able to do this uh, when you're still young. And this is what happens when you actually marry um, into the Kai um, community. Uh, we are called a Kaipal, according to some people. Um, but uh, we've been working together for 15 years. And uh, yeah, we realized it the other day and went, ooh, wow. And so we married stuffed animals, computer vision, robotics. And the talk we're about to give to you today is the marriage of our two interests, our two strengths, and our two backgrounds. So we're going to begin by talking to you about change. How do we weave those webs for change? Because when you think about social impact, you really have to think about change. And yeah, so I'm the spider over there that's not brushing their hair and so on. But before we get into all the specifics, as any of you know, you always have to start with a good story. So let's begin. Once upon a time, there was Otto the spider. And Otto wasn't your typical spider. He liked to brush his hair a lot. He hung out in basements. His webs weren't even quite the normal webs, so on. Well, one day, a big wind came, yo, you, a big wind <laughs> came through and knocked him over. Yeah, his web was gone, or not quite his web. Oh, and he had to figure out what to do if big winds were going to be coming through. Well, he wandered around this basement feeling not so good and feeling sort of sad. And so, next one. And so he happened upon new materials that he didn't expect. There were pieces of, of cloth and knitting needles and so on. And he, he started saying, oh, I could make a very different web. And it might be even stronger than the last one. And so soon a brand new and cheerful web made of leftover pieces of wool had turned the drab gray cellar into a blaze of color. Today, Otto can often be found sitting on this new brightly colored web where he entertains his guests. This is, this is a real story. Uh, we, we suggest you go and see it in the International Children's Digital Library. But it is a wonderful story that is a metaphor for all of us because we never know when the wind's going to come over and knock us over. We never know if it's going to be a personal wind or a collective wind. But yeah, and it's OK to feel sad sometimes, too, after you get knocked over and your hair's all a mess and so on. But we do have to think about how do you address change so that you don't get knocked over the next time, so that your webs don't get messed up so you don't know what to do. And so this is a metaphor for the talk we're about to give, because we need, as, the, as an HCI community, to think about the winds of change and how we weave a web for the future. So what is the future of HCI? If you wander the halls, you'll, of course, this conference, uh, hear lots of ideas for it. And the only thing that I'm sure the future of HCI isn't is any of these technologies listed here. Because <laughs> these are technologies, and technologies are not HCI. Technologies are a means to an end. The end is us, right? What can we do in our world? And technologies are ways for helping us uh, do whatever it is that we want to do. So what we want to do today <clears throat> is we want to give you a call to action. We have homework for all of you. We've been professors for too long, all right? We have homework for all of you, for our whole community, for SIGCHI. And please, Dan Olson, if you're in the audience, please don't 
start saying you need to be on the executive committee. Um, this is, th these are four calls to action for the entire HCI community that we need to start thinking about. Are we already doing this? Yes, we are doing this. But we're doing this in small ways, in different places, not connected. We need to weave that web of change together to make a larger impact for change. And so we're going to give you calls for action, and we're going to propose suggestions for change. These are not the only ways that we may be able to address these areas, but perhaps ways that we may all consider to start with. So we're going to start with our first call to action, design for the world. And it's very exciting to see how many people here at CHI are thinking about designing in a worldwide, in a worldwide view. But this is not just about saying, let's design for the developing world. Even though we have been doing that, we're on that, we're on that too. This is about designing for the world, the industrialized as well as the developing world, about a world view, about not just about your country, your, your town, about other, all of them. So let me begin by saying that there's a lot of horrible things going on in this world. There are children that are child soldiers, there are children enslaved, there, are, there is war, there's poverty. There are so many difficult things in this world. And we know that they are not get, these children are not getting educated, they are not getting access to the materials they need to not be in difficult situations. They, um, there are things that we may never be able to solve with HCI, or maybe we can. But we, one of the things we realize, that a lot of this starts with intolerance and prejudice. Seeing people as being different and not as good as us. And one of the most wonderful things about the Kai community is about embracing differences. And so we have done this with our research and the goal of our work, our longest perhaps shared work between Ben and I, has been the International Children's Digital Library. It's not about reading books. It's not about how to make more literate kids. It's about how people tell stories and we find out that their stories may be the same as our stories, that they may care about similar things or that they may have very different points of view that we never knew about. That's the purpose of the International Children's Digital Library and designing for the world. And so it's been research that we've had the honor of, of working together on for over eight years now. Um, some people that are sitting in this audience uh, helped start this, actually. There's Juan Pablo Arcade, uh, there is, uh, there's Hillary Hutchinson somewhere wearing her Google t-shirts, yeah. Um, and, uh, and many others that have worked on this over the years. And, um, but what we want to do is show you that when you think about designing for the world, you're thinking in a very different way. So Ben's gonna give you a little bit of a demo. So, uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, here's the, here's the live website, and I encourage you all to go uh, read books. And I will say, even though it's okay if you actually do read a book, it's not only about uh, under, understanding other people. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll see if we can uh, rely on the uh, web right now, because this is a live thing. Otherwise, we have some little video backup. And uh, my experience so far... Did you click on it? I clicked. Oh, good. Okay, here we go. See, you know it's a live demo when Allison and Ben get to go pitter-patter, pitter-patter back and forth, okay? All right, so... Uh, okay, so all of you that are tweeting right now, could you just slow down, don't tweet yet, okay? <laughs> and let us, let us try and demo, and then you can continue just, tweeting, okay? Just for a minute. <laughs> so uh, we worked very closely with children uh, thinking, working with people from around the world to um, develop a design that supports people with um, vari varying physical abilities, 
with varying language abilities, with various English abilities, and with uh, various kinds of computers. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid this is so slow, this is going to be You know what? This is, I want you all to imagine you are in Mongolia right now, okay? This is the speed of the developing world, my <laughs> friends, okay? Well, actually, this is faster than that, but... You think it's a little... <laughs> all right, so it's a little bit faster than that. But, uh, okay, yeah, we got it. Okay, we got all right, it. so you can see I'm using these facets on the side to do a very visual facet search. It shows me that I'm currently looking for yellow picture books in any language. There are books in lots of languages, but I can go to more choices, and I'm feeling kind of happy right now, so I'm going to see if I can find books that make me happy. If it really and comes up. But otherwise, we'll go to the video. Oh, it's really coming up. Yeah, there we go. Okay, we're manually pedaling this thing, all right, along the way. All right, so uh, I can keep on refining my search. I will uh, get, show, get results of my search and get to this uh, book in Arabic and English written by a Palestinian um, called uh, Black Ear, Blonde Ear, thinking about, it's a great book, I strongly recommend it, looking at uh, how people can come to understand each other really the perfect uh, metaphor for the ICDL. When you get to the book, you get a visual overview of the book, eventually. All right, I think next time around we're going to show video. Yeah, I think so. I think you, got, you all now have gotten the experience of being mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. of fast internet connections, and in, we're not quite in the developing world, but yeah. Um, and actually, for years, Hillary Hutchinson would say to us, this, this is going to be too slow on a slow connection. We can't make it that big. We can't do it. So um, we All have right. learned. All right. Fortunately, I have a video that does pretty much the same thing. So here's that book. Catch up. We have volunteer translators around the world, about over a thousand of them, that have been translating the uh, metadata for the books and now starting to translate the books themselves. When you go and click the book, you get a visual overview. You can mouse over, get a pop-up in case you're on a small screen. Then you click on the page and actually get to the full scan of the book. And you then can go and read the book page by page. We've really focused the design of the interface to support picture books. Uh, so we always show the text in the context of the picture. You can switch between one page up at a time or two page up. You can zoom in and out uh, and so on. The, uh, there's a lot of uh, information for adults and people that are interested in about the library itself, but this interface that you see here is the focus uh, on using it. Uh, the library itself, you can see over here, has been translated into 16 languages for the interface, even left, uh, right, left to right and right to left interfaces. Uh, so there's a lot here, and an important part, the reason we want to spend the time showing this to you is because it has been kind of the uh, uh, core basis for a lot of our research together over the last eight years because it has become a platform with content and users from around the world. We have you know, something on the order of 100,000 unique visitors a month, which means that we as HCI researchers have a place to play with all kinds of other ideas that you'll hear throughout this talk. Yeah, and one of the reasons that it is as different as it is in terms of the interface, right down to how do you search for a book by the color of the book cover and by how it makes you feel, is because we worked, we worked with children as partners. And we'll talk to you more about that. But in terms of how this, how this uh, library is being used today, we have retired teachers going off to South Africa and using it to support um, preschool children in, in their learning experiences. We also, um, more recently, we've had classes of children adopting books in the, IC, in the ICDL um, and picking a theme. And this Romanian class actually translated books on bullying and, um, and did reviews and translations and so on. It was it, very exciting work. We also, some of our oldest um, use of the library has been as um, uh, learning English as a second language. And so we found out early on that our most, uh, one of our most frequent countries of use was Taiwan because they were teaching, uh, they were teaching working mothers um, English with this. We also did a, <clears throat> a much larger study 
over four years to understand children, uh, children and teachers and librarians and parents, ideas about uh, books, technology, and their worldview when they are when they are using um, when they are using a digital library. Suffice to say, we could go into a whole long talk about this, but we're not going to. But it was in four countries: New Zealand, Germany, Honduras, and yes, Chicago, um, in the U.S., which is another country into itself. Keep going. Um, and uh, it was a, a large qualitative study um, in looking at. Um, in looking at the changes that happened over four years, and we saw no, no shock, increased motivation to read. Um, the, these kids uh, would actually actively seek out more diverse books, and they had, you know, uh, more confidence. But one of the things that really, um, really changed our worldview was that their worldview was expanded. Before we started, we had kids that told us the the, the kid that was most different to them was somebody that was down the street because they didn't think the way they did. However, afterwards, their worldview was about kids in many other countries and many other cultures. So there are many other projects that are, people are thinking about how do you change the world and how do you design for the world. And one of them is uh, a project called HCI for Peace. It has been spearheaded by um, one of our former students, um, who's now a professor at the University of Iowa, Juan Pablo. And, um, and it is an amazing thought process to say, OK, how do we go from having peace on, on ribbons to creating and thinking about technologies that will promote peace? And so yeah, that's a great, that's a great wish. But maybe it takes starting the conversations before, before anything can happen. If we never start the conversations, how do you make a change? Um, so the idea of the badges, go walk up to somebody and, and say, hey, have you thought about peace? Have you thought, can we really do this? Because, there, because yeah, is it, a, is it just a, is it a hope, is it a dream? Yes, possibly. But, next slide. We believe this can be expanded. We believe that he's, Juan Pablo, you're just missing a few words on the badge, okay? That this can be the beginning of what we think is the HCI Peace Corps. So how did this get started? How did our thinking about this get started? Well, when I was director of the HCIL, the Human Computer Interaction Lab, until about four years ago when Allison took over, and when I took over from Ben Schneiderman, uh, we're all here today, um, the, uh, one of the th projects that I instituted was a lab-wide service day. So the idea was that we wanted to give back to our communities for all of the ways that the community has helped us do our work. And so we put out a public call and asked nonprofits or government agencies to tell us if they needed our help, our HCI help. And we um, picked one group, and uh, our whole lab went and visited them for a day. We worked with the U.S. National Holocaust Museum. We worked with PBS. Uh, and uh, who am I forgetting? U.S. What? UN. UN. Thank you. The United, United Nations. Nations. Yeah, it's just uh, a small group. So it was forget. great. Uh, but it was one a year. And there's a lot more organizations than one a year that need help. So fortunately, Allison is director, and she thinks bigger than me. <laughs> Do you think? Yeah, yeah no. Um, actually, this is about let's, yes, every good big idea starts small. And you all may be doing something in your community to help, to give back. Well, we, wanna, we want to grow this idea. We, we believe that it can happen so that it's not just about our lab giving a day. What about, what about if it's, all, it, it's many of you that want to come and join us on a service day. In fact, May 26, you can, you can come and join us. It's six different locations in the, um, the Washington, D.C. area where we will be um, helping design for nonprofit and uh, government agencies that might not have the funding to support, to do the good work. So you have everything from our local national public radio station um, to 
uh, kids.gov, to uh, Casa de Maryland uh, for immigrant communities in our area, and so on. But we don't think it should stop there. Yes, it's great. You could come visit us in Maryland, and we can, on May 26, uh, about 100 people across the area could, could actually give back to the community. But we think it can go further. Imagine if you do the same thing in your community on, on the same day next year. Now imagine if it's, if it's more than just one day in your community. Imagine if we start doing master's projects, PhDs. Think about sabbatical work. It can be, it can grow to a much larger thing. And so our first call to action, Design for the World, our proposal to you, let's, as, as a CHI community, let's create the HCI Peace Corps. So the second call to action is to partner for deepest change. Motivated by the first call, we know that our best work is when we are taking advantage of the skills that we have in understanding technology to solve real people's problems. But in order to understand what the real people's problems are, you need to talk to people. Of course, we, don't, we do all know this, but our strongest, most powerful work has always come when we work with partners that come to us with real driving problems and we work on those. And that comes in a wide range of, of types of partners from uh, nonprofit, government, industry, corporate, you name it. And so we believe that if you partner with, uh, with real people, it's not just to be left to the practitioners to have all the fun, all right? Karen Holtzblatt is not the only person that can go out and hang out with people. Everybody, academics, go figure. You can leave your labs. You too can partner with real people. And that's what we've been doing for years and years. And what we, um, we will give you a few um, examples of this, but our deepest change has come when we partner with other people. In fact, this has been so influ uh, this has so influenced uh, what we do, it also influences even the methods we use in terms of our own research. Um, some of you uh, may have heard me talk about this, but in thinking about um, children, traditionally, we think about observing them as users or asking them to test something after, after something's been created, or even bring them in at various key moments during the design process to inform the design experience. But how about partnering with them on an ongoing basis? And that's what we do at the University of Maryland twice a week um, in the afternoons and two weeks during the summer. Kids are short graduate students, and they're there, and they're a part of the experience. And yes, they're going and demonstrating the International Children's Digital Library um, at the Library of Congress. They're working on projects that have to do with Carnegie Hall, and so on. Next slide. The underlying, um, the underlying dimensions of these roles that I suggest have to do with how we relate to, um, to children as, as developers and researchers. It's not just about having a dialogue with people. It's about that elaboration process. And so Ben may have a great idea and say, ah, let's do a live demo at, um, during our talk. And I say, yes, if we do a live demo, let's make sure we wear lobster hats. Well, if we wear lobster hats, Juan Pablo says, oh, then we should definitely have music. We're building on each other's ideas. It's an elaboration process. It's not a dialogue that has, no, that has non sequiturs. The relationship to the technology um, is very, at the very beginning, we can have an effect on our partnership experience with ideas. And certainly the goals for inquiry, this is not about generalizable research. This is not about, I'm absolutely scientifically sure that this, this will work in this way. This is about usability. <clears throat> this is about asking somebody if this is what they really want, as opposed to, um, as opposed to all the specifics. Um, we have a lot of different partnering methods. We, we give tutorials, uh, uh, courses on this um, uh, at CHI and other places, and we can go into this forever. But um, suffice to say, it's not about a big old whiteboard and a whole bunch of people writing on yellow pads about what we do. Keep going. So in working with different partners, 
Um, we've been, uh, we've had the opportunity to, um, to work on very diverse projects that we would not have normally even thought about. Um, yes, there have been great HCI researchers thinking about um, going outside and working, um, and working and collecting data. We actually started to think about how to share ideas and worked with the National Park Service um, in the United States. These wonderful national parks are everybody's. And we started to think about, yes, yeah, this was, this was pre-iPad. Believe me, this kid is lugging around um, a tablet. Um, anyway, and thinking about how do, you, uh, how do you share that experience as you're walking through the woods. Keep going. We've been working with UNICEF in collecting stories for a worldwide voice of stories. And you can, go to, you can go to URLs and look for our stories. And you can find the voices of, of, um, of kids everywhere talking about their experiences. And, uh, and we had a fabulous experience when they came to the lab to start to work with us on this. And they were shocked that we couldn't figure out where to start, uh, where to, start to create those stories. More recently, we've been thinking about music education and what that means for new kinds of um, new kinds of social musical interactions. This is not about making a better instrument, as as many people think about. This is about how do you bring together um, the music community in thinking further about co-design and bringing together like-minded people, um, particularly, believe it or not, high school kids in India, and Mexico, and here in New York City. So our call to action is partner for deepest change. And we, we all have these partnerships. This is not something that's shockingly new. But how about starting to think about creating organizations that can be, that can be influenced by larger set of partnerships? And so in fact, we've begun to talk at the University of Maryland about creating new learning partnerships and perhaps starting new schools. So this is an example of all, for all of us to think about. How do we transform that connection that learners have with new information? It's not just one technology at a time. We could consider how we bring together our partners so that perhaps you're teaching environmental um, science with the uh, National Park Service as you're developing new technologies. So you're thinking about music education with Carnegie Hall um, and, and so on. And so it's time for the third call to action. Again, building on the previous one, if we're going to design broadly and we're going to partner broadly, we need to build broadly. It is not enough to build tools to run an experiment. I'm sorry. Experiments are great, and there's a wide range of doing things. But it is crucial that as the um, field of HCI matures, that we think much more broadly about how we do our work. And the world is so big, we need to be getting uh, much bigger feedback from broad communities, not 10 people in a study, not 100 people, but let's, we should be having 10,000 or a million people that are participating in the projects that we build. And there's really no reason that almost everything that we as HCI researchers can't do that. Um, <clears throat> in our own work, we have uh, tried to do this, uh, not always successfully. Uh, but we have a long track record of taking our research ideas, building prototypes, and really putting the extra, sometimes painful energy and engineering work into polishing them and putting them out there so that people can really use them. Uh, uh, some of you may know I've been spending, I've spent many years building uh, what's sometimes called zoomable user interfaces. Uh, and one example is a built counterpoint, which was a plug-in for PowerPoint to make zoomable presentations. And a lot of people used it. It got a lot of people out there thinking about this. And I'm delighted to see now that Microsoft has incorporated, a, uh, have made a very similar kind of project uh, called PPTplex. Uh, and then there's also a European project called Prezi uh, that lets you make zoomable presentations. And if you haven't tried these out, I encourage you to do so. Uh, <clears throat> and there's a lots of different kinds of uh, projects of this nature um, that, of course, many people in the HCI community have done. One of the more recent ones that we've done is StoryKit, uh, developed largely by Alex Quinn, graduate student, sitting over there in yellow. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, which is, asks the research question, can you take your mobile devices, which we know are good for communicating and for consuming content, 
and can we develop tools to really support creative expression and so we want to say can you not only read books we had already written and i said yell out for i phone but can you write books and it's a little bit of a challenging question but with many many revisions of an interface we came up with something that is we think is a usable to support creating of text objects image sound and so on and the story kit is an app that is freely downloadable app from the app store and and we actually use the this app with our kids team and our whole team of graduate students and and staff in thinking about how to design uh, this, uh, this, this application. Um, and now you can share these stories um, to, uh, to each other. Sorry. And what happens um, is that uh, Ben is trying to find where, where one example story is. And yes, we did get permission to show this in public. But, uh, but we have lots and lots of people all using this application now. And you're not you're not going to be able to tell zombie cake. I am. Hold on, hold on. Okay, all right. We've got to no, do that. No, no, anyway, no. Um, and it is a, and the idea behind uh, this is that it's not a it's not a URL that the whole world can get. When you decide to share it, you get a you get a private URL, and then it's up to you to decide if you would like to share it with your grandparents that are in another country or with uh, or with other people. You wouldn't think it would be that hard to click on a link. Uh, why don't you just, Ben, why don't you go to the video? Yeah, how about okay, that? Okay, well, too late. Too late. Right. No, okay. not too late. Not too late. Go to the video. All right. We're just not going to play with the live web at this point. Okay. Um, ben is going to be the, um, uh, he will be the voice. Um, so this was created by someone we have absolutely no idea who they are except for the fact that we, we did ask them their permission. It's called Zombie Cake, and it was created it was created clearly by adults and kids because when you click on those little icons there, um, you hear a bunch of kids scream, zombie cake! Okay. And Sounds sort of like that. <laughs> so after a tough night giggling, Zoe Zombie wanted some cake, so she went to the cake store. Uh, the baker said, oh yeah, now we got to wait for this video to come back. Come on, you can do it. All right. And, all right. and the baker said, something. Something like, yeah, all right. Uh, we have delicious cake, all different kinds of cake. Uh, and if you click on the, if you click toes. on the- Toes. Toes and cats and all different kinds of cake. And you can even get, uh, let's see, all that's left of this brain cake. Are you interested in a brain cake? Yes. Okay. So Zoe Zombie brought the ba uh, brain cake and ate it all and it made her full and happy. Brains. Yeah. All right, and then they say, <laughs> The end. Please note that no one was forced to eat any brains in the making of this story. Okay, so, <laughs> so these are the kinds of amazing things that people are doing um, with this. Uh, but we are finding that they are doing something besides making zombie cakes with this. But the point is, you know, we could have built this thing that we used in our lab. Uh, and uh, I promise you, to go to the extra effort of making something that is polished enough to ship out in the, Apple, in the app store and get people to use and respond to uh, users of the app essentially means that we shipped and built a product, which, you know, to be honest, we as academic researchers are not fully prepared to do. But in doing so, it gives us tremendous understanding that we would never get if we closed use of this app to our friends. So one of the really interesting results that we're starting to see now, um, Allison has a grad student, Beth Bone Senior, that's analyzing the content of the stories uh, that these people out in the world are making. And one of the key things that our early results are showing is that the kinds of stories and the devices that they use to make the stories on dramatically changes on weekdays and weekends. So what's going on? Well, for example, on weekdays, we see a lot more use on iPod touches and a lot more content that is more factual and sort of article-ish and like people as if they were writing little book reports or encyclopedia stories. And on the weekends, we see a lot more use on iPhones and a lot more creative uh, expression, you know, storytelling like the kind you just saw. So what's going on? Schools versus home, which is both interesting and kind of scary. <laughs> exactly, there are no zombies in uh, school. So, again, developing for the messy world, 
when we initially built ICDL, we started off actually just thinking about search. Then we started getting some interesting books, and so we thought we uh, better um, make us some book readers. Then we started getting users from around the world. And in fact, today, over half of our users are from outside the United States. And I kept on trying to put this to rest, because we're putting a lot of technical effort into it. But there always seemed to be some exciting new things to do. Uh, and one of the really surprise things that happened is that in my own life, the size of the screen of my computer on my desk only grows. Right? I'm pretty sure, I don't know how big it's going to get, but I'm pretty sure it's going to get bigger than it is today. However, when we look at our use logs, we find that the actual average screen size of ICDL users over time has been shrinking, not growing. So why is that? Uh, two essential reasons. One is that the library is getting used much more broadly from many other countries, which often have much uh, uh, less expensive devices, and so they have smaller screens. And even in this country, um, people are using them on netbooks and on mobile phones and much smaller computers. And so the reality is that there is a very, very diverse ecosystem. So that encouraged us to spend a lot of time thinking about how to support readability. So again, Alex came to the rescue. Uh, and together, we built a few mechanisms to support um, more readability because, as you can see, you often read these, re viewing these things on very small screens. I am just going to show you a very short uh, video of two solutions that we built to increase the readability. Uh, one is that we used uh, computer vision to recognize on the back end where the text is on the page. And since we're showing the context, the text in the context of the picture book, we still wanted to be able to show, continue that. So we have this mechanism where when you click on the page, it pops out the text in the context of the picture. You can click again, and then it shrinks. Or you can just press the right arrow key, and it will just sequence along uh, large, small, large, small, large, small. This works really well for unusual text layouts where you have clouds, background, and rotated text. It really works well to support the um, intention of the author. It works very well for very tiny windows. Uh, in fact, this was the technology that we used to make the iPhone app to, again, support text and image and still make it readable. We then went to another level, and uh, you'll see here we can now support translation of this text. And we do that by going one step farther and removing the text from the image and then using the web browser to render operating system rendered text on top. And so now we can change. We've you know, essentially made a separate layer of text which we can then use to translate and potentially support accessible access as well. So we're really excited about uh, that dramatically increases the availability of the library. So once we started, well, once we going down this path of making ICDL broadly available, of course, we also, had to re we also came to realize that the web is not the only way to access the information in the world. Uh, we built an iPhone app. When that came out, uh, we um, supporting a range of educational laptops. And we're happy to have an iPad app that came out when iPad launched uh, uh, a couple weeks ago. So we're really trying to go where the children are. Because if our goal is to support intercultural understanding and access to information, it doesn't really work if you're not giving the tools to make it actually accessible. Uh, I will just mention on the side, this idea of building for a messy world goes in all kinds of ways. So uh, part of my own research in thinking about interfaces to support small devices was in collaboration with Microsoft Research. And we did all kinds of interesting things. And my colleague there, John Sangiovanni, said, you know, he wants to go even farther and not only build a few individual apps, but let's you know, really uh, pump this up, build a company, uh, and make a whole bunch of apps. And so Zumobi is now out in Seattle. Uh, building on a lot of this kind of style of thinking of interface and is building all kinds of media-based uh, smartphone apps. So uh, there's all kinds of paths towards getting stuff out there. So last example I want to show in this way of thinking about trying to take advantage of, um, of real users is again motivated by ICDL, where, as you saw, we now have this ability to um, offer translated books we need the translations. It's not enough to have the technology. We need the content. So we said, no problem. We'll just go. In fact, a lot of times our research goes this way. We'll say, well, we have some need. We'll just go look to see what the technology world offers and see if we can use it. So 
course, there's machine translation. You could use Google Translate, and that'll give us something that's fast and cheap, but not actually good enough to read a children's book. So we could hire a professional bilingual human. That gives excellent quality, but whoops, we can't just afford the 20 cents or 37 cents per word that we have been quoted recently. Uh, we could go the Wikipedia route and get um, uh, volunteers where we'll get some hopefully happy medium, and it seemed like that might be a good solution. But if you go and look even at there, you'll find that while there are a huge number of Wikipedia contributors in general, the number of translators in Wikipedia in comparison is literally that much smaller. And the reason is bilingual um, skills are rare among humans. And when people have them, they often don't want to give them to me, even though I think they should. So uh, what we really want is something that is you know, high quality, really affordable, and can take advantage of the resources that we actually have. What resources do we have that are truly scalable? Well, we have this machine translation, and we have all of these users of ICDL. Remember I told you it's a platform for us, so how can we harness those users? And the answer is we, we actually can because those people all have great skills. They are expert speakers of one language. So can we somehow take advantage of those people? And the answer is yes, we are now building a web interface to harness that, um, that looks something like this. We can just zoom into this area. And the idea is you take your source language, you put it through machine translation, which has still enough redundancy and contextual information from the image in the book, that your target language speaker, the person that speaks just the one language you're translating into, has the potential for cleaning up that language, making it fluent, and if they have any questions, they can ask a question, they have a special, we have a developing an interface that works for non, uh, non-textually, so you can highlight a word and put a question mark by it, you can send images and pre-translated um, um, thoughts back and forth, and there's a whole bilingual protocol, uh, and our preliminary experiments are showing that in fact this does give us that target area um, with, some, with some effort, but uh, it's quite hopeful. So again, how do we take advantage of building stuff in, at, at scale? And so you can see, when you think about building for the messy world, there's a lot, there are a lot of different stories we all have about how HCI really has created a successful situation. But a lot of people don't know that. And so we suggest for this call to action that we create an HCI success story repository. But it's not just good enough to put it on YouTube. Um, I take, uh, we take um, uh, actually inspiration from uh, Ben Schneiderman, who has been very instrumental in thinking about museums and art schools and creativity. We need to put these stories, these human computer interaction stories, in exhibits where people are thinking about these kinds of things so that we can show the next generation that it is about. It is about how we relate to humans and computers in HCI. So our last call, our last call to action actually goes to leading with HCI. We, we all regularly get knocks on the door saying, hey, could you help me with something, whether it's the White House calling or it's uh, or it's your collaborator. It's only Allison that gets called by the White House. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, uh, but it's whether it, it's your colleagues, whether it's a, a nonprofit organization, but we're all sitting around waiting for someone to knock on the door. It's time, folks, to be leaders and to lead with HCI and to, and to say, folks, it's to start with HCI, not to wait for when somebody needs us. So let's look at a couple examples here. It's uh, really gratifying or really nice to see so much work in this conference this week and of course in the field in general about designing for the developing world. And these are people that I think really are leading, really trying to go you know, outside of their comfort zone often and take all of the technology lessons that we've learned and throw them away but take the core values that we as HCI researchers know and figure out how to apply them to, again, solve real people's needs. And often you'll see the same you know, mantra coming over again, to make things really work broadly, you have to focus on simplicity. 
Uh, and there's all kinds of examples. I just picked out a few. Uh, Bill Thies from MSR India is focusing on how do you get rid of computers entirely and use the technology that people have, which are often televisions and just regular DVD players. Not computer DVDs, but the kind that played in movies and is building book readers and even PowerPoint and web browsers based on, uh, on that technology. Matt Cam is trying to think about how do you build not a $100 laptop, but a $10 computer based on uh, existing really expensive, inexpensive video games. And Chris Hoadley at NYU has made some really provocative criticisms and quite justified, I think, uh, in looking at educational laptop use. One of the things that he found in looking um, in uh, some deployments in India is that the, lap the electricity, which is always a problem in these situations, the electricity supplies for these laptops often come from diesel generators, often hooked up to the main, connected to the main community center, which is the school, which sounds like a good idea, except the diesel generators are so loud, you can only run them at night, uh, which is slightly conflicting with the idea of needling electricity to run your educational laptops during the school day. So all kinds of really interesting challenges. Um, Going back to our running example, I told you this has been a theme throughout our work and many, for many years. Uh, in co in uh, collaboration with the government of Mongolia's Ministry of Education on a World Bank funded national literacy project, uh, we built a uh, Mongolian version of the library. <coughs> And for yes, he went to Mongolia, yeah, not me. <laughs> right, so uh, Allison goes to the White House, I go to Mongolia. <laughs> Somehow things are not quite fair here. Or maybe they are, I like this. So uh, setting up servers in Ulaanbaatar was relatively easy. Actually, it turned out it wasn't easy at all, but it was relatively easy. It turned out things got really interesting when we set up a little convoy and drove for literally two days to try to get some, to some rural areas. Uh, and we're going back with Greg over here in the, uh, in the fall to continue this project, but we went to all kinds of places, and we went to schools, and we found that they had computers. Whoops. Um, you could wipe the dust off of these dust covers because they had uh, no printers, no internet, no software, no training. No people. No people. So uh, that was a challenging computer setup, but they had it set up in a very nice room. Uh, <laughs> we. Uh, had, though, a really strong motivation, even though we saw these problems, which is that these were the libraries of books that the children that we found were being offered. These were quite literally Soviet propaganda from the, you know, 40, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, because of this World Bank funding, they were creating new libraries, and now they have this nice collection of newly published Mongolian children's picture books, which is really exciting. Uh, but we still wanted to, and they wanted to say, can we, in concert with the traditional paper, which was the primary effort, also consider technology as a way to think about scaling up, because again, printed distribution was just too hard. Uh, and they wanted to get books beyond the 200 Mongolian books that they had managed to acquire for this uh, project. And when you go and visit these kids, of course, uh, you really want to help them. So. We started by with um, doing some uh, early experiments by building out these uh, few computer labs with local networks You're running the same ICDL you saw running on a server's computer that was accessed just in this room. Uh, and we are now trying to scale up by learning the same lesson that a lot of other people have learned in this doing this kind of work, which is to get rid of the network and to get rid of the big computer. It's just too hard to maintain. And so we are now building a uh, static version that we can distribute on HTML DVDs or uh, thumb drives. Uh, and we're going to go back and do some teacher training and training of teacher trainers and see if we can get this uh, more broadly distributed. And so the last thing, last example that I want to talk to you about is how much great work is being done in uh, trying to apply lessons from HCI and the rest of the computer world as well to support, uh, uh, to support better government. Uh, one example that I really like is Tim O'Reilly of the O'Reilly Book, the O'Reilly Book Publisher, who's writing a really great book. I encourage you to go take a look at this. Um, trying to encourage, like a lot of people are, transparency and open government and open access to data. Um, there's a great group called uh, Sunshine, uh, uh, Sunshine Organization, you should take a look at the Sunshine Foundation. And so there's all of these projects that people are doing of trying to push 
HCI mechanisms, HCI thinking to broader use. Uh, one example that uh, I did in this area uh, is to look at voting systems, the usability of voting systems. And the reason is, some of you may remember that in the United States in the year 2000, we had presidential election that had some problems. Uh, and while voting systems, like all complex systems, have to work at all of these levels, the actual problems that occurred in 2000 were primarily usability, uh, focused on this infamous now butterfly ballot and hanging chad. And so we observed this, and I remember, actually, I think it was JP came into the office one day and said, hey, you should really do you know, stuff on trying to solve the usability of these voting systems. This was a disaster. And I said, I don't do voting systems. I don't do anything about it. That's way out of my scope. And then, over the next year or two, we saw how the computing community responded to these usability problems in 2000, which is they focused on security. There is this huge effort, you know, completely legitimate and very important to make sure that there are voter verifiable paper trails and make sure there wasn't fraud and all kinds of stuff. But usability got dropped. It was not being explored by the general uh, computing community. So I partnered with a um, uh, Paul Hernson, a colleague of mine in the Department of Government and Politics, and we ran a pretty substantial three-year study, which we ended writing a book about, so I'm only going to thankfully give you the very, very short version um, of, but we looked at um, literally thousands of participants, had them use a range of commercially shipping machines, and really focused on what kinds of things worked and didn't work. Uh, uh, we actually looked at five machines and one prototype that we built to demonstrate what we thought were best practices, and I'm just going to show you three key results. With these two left machines being perhaps the ones to focus on because they're most broadly, they're representative of the most broadly kind of used machine. This is a typical paper optical scan ballot where you um, just use a number two pencil and fill in ovals. And this one here is a uh, traditional touch screen which has a fairly, depending on your perspective, nice, clear uh, uh, display where you can just touch on the ballots. We gave people tasks such as vote for this presidential candidate. You'd think that was pretty straightforward, but we did this in malls and senior centers, right? It was a very realistic setting, and we found, similar to what um, anecdotes so, that there were errors um, that were typically three or four percent, and they were real errors. We told people who to vote for, and they would often touch the person next to it, and even though it looked pretty visible, and to me, as a user, and there were review screens, people still make significant mistakes. And so this is important because those number of areas right, are pretty high in this, in this domain. And that was for an easy task. When we gave people hard tasks, like ask them to vote for two people or to change your vote midway, we saw really, really high numbers of er errors that were really quite troubling. And the last one is really uh, also quite surprising, which is we asked uh, part of American elections is to have the ability to do what's called a write-in candidate, where if you want to vote for someone that's not on the ballot, you're given a blank line and you can literally write in anyone's name you want. And you would think, at least on the paper ballot, that people would do well. And what we found is that following the laws that most of our uh, you know, municipalities, most of, the most of the people that run these elections follow, almost 30% of those write-in candidates would not be allowed. They would be discounted. Why is that? Because the laws on the books say that in order to count a write-in ballot, you have to fill in the oval next to that blank line. And people often didn't do that. And so you have to look at the full range of, as we know, activities in any one of these circumstances. Oh, and by the way, if you think this is a contrived example, there are actually a number of well-reported examples of people that have fought uh, and sued for, uh, because they lost an election, because they argued that the, their write-in ballots were ignored because people didn't fill in the, bo in the oval and those you know, result in all kinds of messes. So these are real issues. So our final call uh, for action is to lead with HCI and yes we have had um, you know c uh, basically SIG part of our SIG to go and uh, advise government agencies on um, on different kinds of uh, issues but we think let's think really big now folks let's think why not the United Nations there happens to be the UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in there, 
it has basic human rights that people are, ex are expected to be given. Not to be enslaved, not to be tortured, have the right to move, um, even the right to freedom of thought and opinion. Well, doesn't it concern you if these people have the right to thought and opinion, but they don't have access to information? How scary these opinions may be. And so we suggest, as an organization, as HCI, as, as the CHI community, let us, let us all fight for universal access to information. Let's lobby on the world stage, folks, and let's, let's ask the world to truly understand how important information is to people, because that can change our world in many large and small ways. And so, these are just four calls to action. You may have a fifth, or you may say, you know what, for leading with HCI, we should do something else. Good. For those of you that have managed to sit through this presentation, we appreciate it because we hope you're going to go out and, and you are going to lead with HCI or build tools for the messy world or partner for deepest change or design for the world. Because those are the things that we think are just the beginning for weaving webs of change. Because that's where, hopefully, we can make the most impact in our social world. Because it's wonderful to get a Kai paper reviewed and into this conference. But I have to say, it's even more exciting to have an impact on the world and to see that things can change for small, short people that are children, to elderly people that may not have options that we, we would hope they would, to people that have the possibility to help make change in the world and maybe you've convinced them that some new change is possible. So with this, we want to we don't want to finish our talk without acknowledging some very special people that have inspired us, particularly in the area of social impact. Um, as uh, not only people in the, uh, in the CHI community, but our colleagues at the Human Computer Interaction Lab. Um, and certainly our work could not have even been done without the support of many different organizations, um, commercial and, and uh, nonprofit over the years. So, in particular, we want to thank Sig Kai, of course, for giving us uh, this award. Uh, ben Schneiderman and Jenny Priest, our longtime colleagues at uh, Maryland, who have really encouraged us uh, in thinking big, crazy thoughts, because that's what life is about. Uh, to Dan Olson, who has been a long, strong mentor uh, in everything that we do, to, along with Claire Marie and John Carrot, who have been long friends of HCIL and often come to advisory boards. Um, and also to Randy Pouse, who sadly is no longer with us, but many of you know, uh, was truly an inspiration in thinking big thoughts. And he, uh, you know, one quick story about Randy. Uh, the first year that Allison and I showed up at University of Maryland, Randy gave a call and said, hey, I'm gonna come by and visit you, all right? Uh, here I am. And uh, he came over to just check us out and said, you know, we're really, really excited that you're in HCI and you're doing good work and I wanted to meet you and encourage you and told us how to get tenure and how we should hang puppets and animals on our, on our um, heats, on our steam pipes. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, it was really, uh, really great of him. And of course, all the other people uh, here uh, in this room and elsewhere that we've worked, we appreciate all of you. And finally, please go and do, go off and do wonderful things. Um, and if you can be inspired by people here at the conference, by in the Kai community, please do because this is an amazing uh, this is an amazing group of people that I hope 25 years from now um, I'm still going to be around and um, and making trouble. Thank you very much. Uh, and wait, oh, the symposium. Okay, so, symposium. Go ahead. <laughs> if I don't say this, uh, Ben will hit me on my way out. <laughs> <laughs> so the HCIL has an annual symposium, which is a great way to find out about what all the people in our lab are doing. Uh, it's open with all kinds of interesting things. And but even more important is the 26th, the day before the symposium, 
is our service day and Allison is serious. We really do want you to come over or send your graduate students, rent a van, drive to Maryland. Uh, we have now six groups that we promised to help, so we need your help to help them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and we are happy to take questions as long as they're easy. 